Greetings and welcome to the Game of the Year coverage here at Words About Games. Two-ish weeks of intense coverage of all the best and worst games of 2018. Celebrating the good times and the excellent games. As well as taking a look forward at 2019. Making some predictions for the year ahead and highlighting some of the most exciting games that are due to make an appearance in the next 12 months. Today, we're continuing our list of the top 30 games of 2018. Oh my god. I didn't realise how much time I'd put into State of Decay 2 until I went back to it after feeling an itch that only the methodical, slow-paced zombie survival sim could scratch. Turns out that I'd done a hell of a lot to establish my nearly completed base of operations in amongst the hordes of roaming undead. Incredibly enough, after only a minute or two of refamiliarizing myself with the controls, the rest of the game was pretty intuitive, save for a couple of strangely obtuse design decisions. The experience you get with State of Decay 2 is unlike anything else. Other zombie games tend to lean into the action of fighting off swarms of undead, the drama that an apocalyptic narrative can bring, or the micromanagement of the survival genre. And while all three of these are present in State of Decay 2, there's something quite unique about how the game blends it all together. Massive zombie attacks are relatively rare, meaning that they don't lose their impact. Stories are more personal, with the game mostly eschewing overarching narratives in favour of player-driven stories of desperate survival and funny moments. Survival mechanics are community-wide, rather than personal, making scavenging for supplies a necessity without forcing you to stop playing constantly to top up hunger or thirst meters. It all comes together into a game that I had a hard time putting down whenever it sucked me in. There are some issues, strangely obtuse quality of life designs, and a smattering of bugs and animation glitches. But carving out your own little corner of the apocalypse is a compelling enough experience that most of these issues melt away in the face of an addictive gameplay loop. The Red Strings Club is a cyberpunk adventure game about fate and happiness, where you try to foil an evil, corrupt corporation via pottery and bartending, the two greatest tools in any rebel's arsenal. There's also some hacking, but, well, this is a cyberpunk after all. You also get to teach an android about humanity. The Red Strings Club tells a fantastic story split into three distinct acts. Starting as an android crafting cybernetic upgrades, then mixing drinks behind a bar for a variety of clientele while gathering information and debating humanity and ethics with an android, before putting a plan into action to stop evil Megacorp Limited from doing a very bad thing. The overarching plot is exciting, especially when combined with the unusual mechanics you use to interact with the game, and the great big sprawling puzzle that is the game's final act. But the real joy of playing this game is in its themes. Interacting with the wonderfully varied characters who frequent the Red Strings Club is a delight, and sparring with them about various facets of the human condition, and then breaking down what you've learned in debate with your android friend, is fantastic and constantly surprising. The game isn't afraid to push back against your ideas and make you question your thoughts on a variety of given subjects, done in such a way that the Red Strings Club will give you plenty of thoughts to chew over for days after you play it. Oh, and it looks and sounds awesome, with an incredibly pretty aesthetic and a soundtrack that is amongst the best of 2018. I knew of the Yakuza series only by its reputation and seeing various clips of the game shared on social media before diving headfirst into Yakuza 6, eager to try out this supposedly crazy and heartwarming series for myself. It's definitely newcomer friendly, though the recap at the beginning of the game goes on for perhaps too long and is overloaded with information that I mostly forgot about as I was running around Japan hours later after the game started. While I, and I imagine many other people, only really knew the game via seeing the more bonk as parts of it, such as the over-the-top karaoke or strange phone sex line minigames, what stands out to me more is the game's heart. Sure, all the crazy stuff is here and it's easy enough to find, including all the mad quest lines and side activities you could possibly want. But the closing chapter in Kiryu's saga isn't an emotional one, telling a heartfelt story of a man who thought he'd left the Yakuza life behind only to be dragged back in, attempting to protect the people he cares about. 
It's also a very easy game to play. There are a lot of systems at work in Yakuza 6, including a novel XP system designed around food as much as completing quests. But it's all quite intuitive, and pays out regularly enough that you'll feel constantly rewarded for your time. Similarly, the game's combat is fairly simple and easy to pick up. Though there's depth there if you want it thanks to a ton of unlockable combo based moves, you can get through most non-boss fights by button mashing or picking up the nearest environmental object and swinging it wildly about. Yakuza 6 is a fun time with a cool story and a world I was happy to explore, and definitely one of the better games of 2018. Theme Hospital Remade for 2018 is an accurate description of what Two Point Hospital is. The diseases may have changed, as has the core gameplay, but there's a lot of similarities between this game and the classic hospital simulation. They even managed to get the original PA announcer to give you an unending supply of chuckles, or at least found someone to do an eerily accurate impression. The dev team, many of whom worked on Theme Hospital, haven't strayed too far from the formula that worked so well the first time. There are of course some differences, some of those are fairly minor. Rats have been replaced by outbreaks of mono beasts, diseases have been changed up completely, though they're still hilarious, and deceased patients will become ghosts that need to be dealt with by janitors carrying vacuum cleaners. Other changes are more substantial, such as progression, which is hugely tied to objective based missions. Each level has a series of quests that need to be completed before you can move on to the next, with bonus objectives netting you more points to spend unlocking various items for the different rooms. It's a good tool for slowly unlocking new rooms, diseases and mechanics, drip feeding you the basics of each new gameplay twist before exposing you to the next. If you're like me, then you'll have been disappointed by the lack of a sandbox mode and elated that it was added in a later update ensuring that Two Point Hospital had all the tools necessary to keep pulling me back in on a quest to create the best, most efficient hospital possible. Iconoclasts feels like it was underappreciated when it first launched. Perhaps it was due to it launching during a surprisingly strong January period that saw the release of multiple games that made it into this list, but I feel like no one was really talking about it when it came out at the beginning of the year. It's a damn shame too, because this is an excellent narrative driven platformer. Playing as Robin, a woman whose skills as a mechanic are outlawed, you'll explore a world run by religious zealots, attempting to help anyone you can with your mechanical know-how. At first, Iconoclasts is fairly cute, light-hearted romp as you try to stay one step ahead of the agents attempting to apprehend you. But the further into the story you go, the more you'll find a game filled with an emotional narrative, extremely well drawn characters and some really well designed action platforming. I found it difficult to put the game down as I peeled away each new layer of the game's story, unlocking progressively more expansive levels that were equally challenging and satisfying to explore, with multi-stage environmental puzzles, decent combat and memorable boss fights. Iconoclast itself is a very memorable experience and it's one I'm glad I made the time to play and one I wish more people had taken the time to explore in 2018. Left 4 Dead set in the Warhammer universe was a basic if accurate description of the previous Vermintide game. There's nothing wrong with that. Vermintide is an excellent game, one that made my game of the year list the year it was released. I was pleasantly surprised when a sequel was announced and delighted to find that the developers had put in a ton of work to expand on the basic structure of the first game, leading to an experience that feels like it has so much more to offer than its predecessor ever did. Developer Fat Shark have done an impressive job building on the foundation laid out the first time around. The core gameplay has survived intact as players work together to traverse environments ruined by the end times and filled with objectives and hordes of enemies standing in your way. Combat is visceral and satisfying with plenty of different types of special enemies and mini bosses to keep you on your toes, as well as a fair few new ones thanks to the addition of chaos to the roster of bad guys. It's the expanded class and loot systems that make Vermintide 2 stand out however. The characters here aren't just window dressing. 
each one plays differently. And you can even go deeper on customizing them to your playstyle by choosing classes, leveling through skill trees, and finding loot to equip them with different types of weapons and gear. It's a lot more in depth than the basic Left 4 Dead but Warhammer description would imply, and it makes it a compulsively fun experience with plenty of reasons to go back and play it again and again. Whoa, whoa, no, no, not the dick! Ah, hot, 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 hot! Oh, please, please! I think there might literally not be another experience like A Way Out, a powerful, emotionally charged, narrative driven adventure, but built exclusively for two people to play together, to the point that solo play is impossible. It was a risky move, but one that most certainly paid off, as A Way Out is a fantastic experience that I loved from start to finish. The wild twists and turns in both the narrative and the gameplay were brilliant. Escaping from prison was only the beginning of the adventure, an adventure which was enhanced by having two players work together to overcome its challenges. A Way Out can, at a distance, feel a bit scattered, as it mixes its core gameplay up with great frequency, never really sticking to one thing for an extended period of time. While it can be a bummer to leave behind your favourite sections forever, it creates a very fast paced game and makes the best moments stand out more, like the entire hospital sequence. The main characters have great chemistry and it's very easy to fall in love with them, especially the deeper into the narrative you dive and learn more about them. Sitting next to Keith as we played the game from start to finish together, bickering as our characters bickered, laughing as our characters laughed, was a wonderful experience that neither one of us will forget in a hurry, especially after the apparently divisive ending, which we both agreed was an incredibly powerful and affecting cap to a brilliant game. Round one, fight! Smashing about six or seven different genres of game together to create one whole narrative turned out to be an outstanding idea, at least in the Hex's case. This was one of the most mind-bending and plain interesting games of 2018. You take control of various characters who are an inn full of former video game protagonists when the barkeep is informed that a murder is about to take place. As you play each of these characters, peeling back the layers of a complex and riveting story, you experience flashbacks to how they wound up in the inn, hence the genre hopping, as each character comes from a very different genre of game. You get to experience a JRPG, a tactics game, a mascot platformer, and much more as you try to unravel the identity of the would-be murderer and their intended victim, uncovering a much deeper plot than that of a simple murder mystery. To say any more about the Hex's excellent narrative twists and turns would be to rob you of the full experience, as it's definitely best to go in knowing as little as possible about the game beforehand. It all comes together incredibly well though, and nowhere is this more apparent than in the execution of the disparate gameplay mechanics. All of the different game genres control using W, A, S, D and the mouse. They're all simple enough that you won't get bogged down in an endless series of tutorials and they each last the perfect amount of time before you're moving on to the next one. To say that developer Daniel Mullins has knocked it out of the park would be an understatement. Just do yourself a favour and jump into the Steam forums once you're done if you want to try and figure out what the Hex is really trying to tell you. <laughs> the Missing was a deeply personal game for me. Without getting too into the specifics of the story, the latest game from the weird and wonderful mind of Swery65 hit me on a very personal level. The way the game's themes play into both the overall narrative and the core gameplay loop are fantastically well done. This is a game that is very obviously a labour of love for its creator, something which shines through as you make the harrowing journey across a mysterious island looking for your friend who has gone missing. Thanks to decades of desensitization to violence in video games, it takes a lot to shake me up in that department. So the fact that the moment distraught protagonist JJ is struck by lightning in a painful fashion at the start of the game deeply upset me is a testament to how much this game got under my skin, which can't be understated. This is just the beginning, as JJ not only learns that she can regenerate almost any injury, but that she actively needs to harm and dismember herself to proceed through the game. 
Her cries of anguish and pain as she sets herself on fire to provide a light source or purposefully loses an arm so she can throw it at a distant lever still haunt me. This isn't a game for the faint of heart, but it's a one with a very important message. The brutal violence doesn't exist purely for the sake of it, instead complementing the excellent and emotionally powerful narrative, explored mostly through text messages saved in JJ's phone. JJ's journey is an incredibly affecting one, one that I've been on myself, and she's a character I can easily see myself in. The Missing tells an important story and is easily one of the best games of 2018. What the hell Excellent that? 47, and now for a bit of maintenance. You wouldn't think that the first word that springs to mind about playing as an international assassin unraveling a global conspiracy by meticulously murdering a bunch of terrible people would be fun. But that's the best word I can think to use to describe Hitman 2. Diving into the incredibly detailed worlds of this game and finding new and creative ways to off the awful people who live in them is just a blast from end to end. Hitman 2's greatest strength is in how robust each of its settings are. The environments are huge, the worlds themselves are highly dynamic, and there are a crazy amount of ways for you to dispatch your targets. Whether you opt for a more traditional sneak up and snap their neck or shoot them, or one of the highly creative and brilliantly satisfying story assassinations, killing bad people has never been so compulsive. If all else fails, you could even beat them to death with a fish. Hitman 2 has an absurd amount of depth that few other games can even come close to matching. It's a game that demands to be replayed over and over, testing its boundaries and finding yet more ways to take out targets is an easy addiction to catch. It is fair to say that this is mostly just more Hitman, almost as though this is an expansion of 2016's release rather than a standalone game in its own right. Sure there are minor improvements to gameplay, a graphical upgrade, new locations and a continuation of the story, but all in all this will feel very familiar to anyone who played the previous outing. But when the core is this good, it doesn't really matter all that much. Whether compared to its predecessor or taken on its own merits, Hitman 2 is a highly satisfying game, and one that you'll feel compelled to keep revisiting long after you think you've seen everything it has to show you. Thank you very much for watching this video, guys. If you've enjoyed it, please keep it here at Words About Games. We've got tons, tons, tons of content, including our weekly podcast, more impressions videos, patch notes, and our weekly indie game of the week. We also stream over on Twitch at twitch.tv slash wordsaboutgames every Monday, Thursday, and Saturday. And most importantly, have a great day.